All right, Deuteronomy chapter 3, the uh, conquest of the land of Og. How'd you like to be named Og? <laughs> Sounded like you ought to be in some kind of a Stone Age movie, but uh, quite a, a sophisticated king. And uh, following the Lord's direction, it says in chapter 3, verse 1, Then we turned and went up the way of ba uh, to Bashan. And Og, king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edri. And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land unto thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, and which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan. Isn't it interesting how, yeah, the Lord gave him his too. It's just, here's this guy, and you read in a minute, he's a pretty big guy. Led a nation full of pretty big people. Where he, where he lived was actually called the land of giants. And God said, uh, I got this. Just, you just go do what I told you to do, and don't you worry about it. The consequences are all up to me. You just do what you're supposed to do. You know, the lesson for us in these Old Testament stories is seeing God reward the faithful, seeing God honor his word so that when a man believed what God said, that man could have peace, that man could have the security, the confidence that we talked about earlier. And just thinking about, man, all of the struggle of life is over. I'm trusting God. I don't have to worry about figuring out all this stuff myself. He's going to take care of it. So uh, he gave him all, uh, gave, uh, gave Israel all of uh, Og's stuff too. Verse 3, so Lord, deliver, uh, Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until none was left uh, to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, 60 cities. Imagine that, these wanderers, these people had been uh, 40 years out in the wilderness. They'd been captives in, in uh, Egypt for 400 years as servants and slaves. They just step out of, the, out of slavery, and God gives them a nation, gives them these cities. These cities were, uh, we talk about them in just a minute here, but these cities were, were uh, sort of a, a, the marvel of that, uh, of that day. These, these giants, if you uh, look at any of these archaeological programs, and I, I probably talk about them more than I ought to, but uh, it's kind of interesting the things that these people could produce uh, back uh, 1,000 B.C., 1,500 B.C., 2,000 B.C. These, these uh, gigantic cities, big, gigantic boulders and all that kind of stuff, you know, how in the world did they move those? Well, they want to make it some kind of magic, and I don't, I'm not sure it was magic, but uh, if you take guys, uh, a, a work crew of guys 10, 12 feet tall, uh, feed them a good hefty lunch, I suspect they could probably get some work done in moving rocks and all that kind of stuff. But it, it describes here, uh, verse, verse 4, And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og of Bashan. That word Bashan, I didn't, I didn't make any notes on this, but you remember in the Psalms it talked about uh, the uh, bulls and the uh, things at Bashan. And there's, there's something in all that that is, uh, it looks like it looks beyond the physical into the spiritual realm there. And it recognizes that those bulls were what they worshipped under the, under the guise of the golden calf. Uh, their, their God was uh, all through uh, the, the Far East, the Middle East, Africa, uh, North America, Native American Indians, Canadian Indians. They all worship the horned God. Does that, does that sound like anything that you might recognize? From uh, there, There's something in all that that uh, from the very earliest of days, men knew who the devil was. Men recognized that the, uh, the God of this world was the devil, and if they wanted to succeed on a fleshy level, that God was the one that they followed. And when Christ was on that cross, the spiritual battle that was where the devil fell uh, was fought by the, uh, by the uh, descendants of those of Bashan. Looks like there was something going on there that was beyond the eyes of men. Maybe that's why God put the lights out so that uh, none would be distracted by it. Yeah. So I guess 
the main face of the cherub is an ox. When you, when you see the face of the cherub itself is, a, is an ox's face, scary thought. When, uh, when uh, Aaron made that golden calf, they'd been in Egypt way too long. All of that stuff had soaked in. They weren't worshiping those calves back there. They didn't do that until they got out under God's call. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, we go back to our text here. It says in verse 5, All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars beside unwalled towns, a great many. Uh, some of them were fortress cities, probably where the officials lived. And the other ones were fairly secure in their, their property and their environs. And uh, they didn't feel like they even needed to be necessarily guarded. They had enough uh, military power there to fight off anybody else. They would taken this land from somebody else, felt quite secure there. Uh, that's just the way lost men are. And then God comes along and spoils their security. Uh, verse 6, we utterly destroyed them as we did unto Sion, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children in every city. That, that's heartbreaking to hear that. But uh, again, we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to uh, at least read through a, a section of this text here. Shall not the God of all the earth do right? utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the cattle and the spoil of these cities we took for prey to ourselves. And we took at that time of, out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on this side Jordan from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon the Sidonians called Siron, and the Amorites called it Shinir. You know, one of the things that makes uh, history so tough to follow Everybody has a different name for something. If you're going to New York, you might be going to the Big Apple, or you might be going to New York City, or you might be going to the business capital of the world, or you might be going to, uh, I don't know, probably another dozen names I'm not familiar with or can't remember. But uh, it's all the same place, just different, known by different names to different groups of people. Uh, verse 10, all the cities of the plain, all Gilead and all Bashan and uh, uh, Salcha and Edri, cities of the uh, kingdom of Og of Bashan. All of these land was uh, highlands where Og dwelt was somewhere down on the kind of the north end of, uh, of the Dead Sea, moving up uh, towards uh, Jericho up that way. And that's the land that they took from him. And that became, as we'll see here in a minute, their sort of their launching pad for their various infiltration of the, of the land after that. Once they conquered these groups of people, they settled in there uh, briefly while they're reclaiming other ground. Verse 11 says, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the, uh, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbah of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth uh, uh, of it after the cubit of a man. We'll tell you in a minute how big that was. Uh, anybody ever hear of a, a fellow named Josephus? Uh, he was a... Church yeah, he was a, well, he was a, a, a Jewish man... He was a historian for, for the Romans, and the various Jew, Jewish groups saw him as a traitor because he was more aligned with the Romans. Uh, but he wrote histories, and he talked about the bones of these giants that were in Jerusalem in the first century. They, they were still there to be seen, and some of the things, the artifacts that they'd taken from these tribes, and they were there to be to go uh, to observe. He didn't write about them as they had been there. They were there when he when he uh, wrote about them, and he'd seen them. And uh, today, there there's a great kind of quandary of are those real? Were they really giants? Uh, those people knew what a big man was. That uh, they knew who uh, Samuel was. Not not too long after this. He was head and shoulders above everybody else, but they didn't call him a giant. He was just a very large man. So I suspect they knew quite, uh, quite well what a giant was in contrast to that. This man had a bedstead that is 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide. And uh, 
reading through various commentaries and, and uh, opinionaries of things. So, well, he just made it that big so he could impress people. Impress them with what? If he didn't fill that thing up, you know, it looked like he looked like a little baby laying in yours. That's, that's not impressive. Uh, they, they said that uh, uh, Alexander the Great had a, tactics like that. It, some of their tents, he made a little larger and the bed frames in there. And when the, the locals would see it, they, wow, look at these big men. But they could see the men. I mean, they weren't going to be impressed by that. I think that's just people's excuses. So a cube, as I understand it, is from the elbow to the tip of the finger? Yeah, typically taken to be 18 inches. Okay. I'm sure there's a variation there. But, but the giants were in charge there, Genesis chapter 6 and here. Yeah. No, I, I don't. Well, they had another one that they used. It was, uh, I, I don't remember even now what they called it, but it's another cubit. Uh, but it says after a cubit of a man. And they're, they're, you're reading that earlier on before, before they encounter these guys. But listen, don't think because this is their first encounter. They didn't know about these guys. Their, their fame would be around the world. That, this is not something that is isolated. These, these people, I suspect, are really well known though people might not have seen a whole bunch of them. They, they weren't mysteries to people. They knew they were there. So uh, if you've got a bed that's 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide, uh, chances are you're not 13 and a half feet tall, but you're bigger than the average man by a considerable amount. Goliath was said to be uh, six, six cubits in a span. That'd be nine and a half feet. One of our uh, young fellows years ago is a pretty uh, artistic, drew us a man on a piece of paper. I should have put that up here tonight. And it was a picture of a man, nine and a half feet tall, very proportional, a rugged guy, but a nine and a half feet tall. That would be about to the, almost to the ceiling there, from here all the way up to there. And a guy that big isn't just, you know, these are men of war. This guy probably weighed 800 pounds, 900 pounds maybe, of muscle. These are some serious people to encounter. And uh, every time they encountered God's people, God killed them all. Isn't that amazing? They what for? Show you that it, God's not afraid of giants. God is not intimidated by the enemy, no matter how big he is, no matter how threatening he looks. God is a, a, he's nobody. He's just a dirt pile, may pack pile a little higher, but we'll take care of him. So he goes on, uh, and this land which we possess, possessed at the time, at that time from Aror, which is by the river Arna, and half the mountain of Gilead, and the cities thereof, I gave unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites. If you remember, the Reubenites and the Gadites were people that, when they, they, they raised cattle, so when they got to a certain point before they went across the Jordan River, they said, man, we found our homeland. This is where us cowboys want to live. We're going to settle down here. Can we have this? And, and Moses says, uh, yeah, you can have it, but you ain't going to get it until you go in there and fight with the rest of us. We're here together. We're going to take that land together. You can claim this land, but you're not going to get it until we, we all get our, our, uh, our land. Uh, verse 13, the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh all the region of Argob with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Something about all that stuff. Uh, let, me, let me catch us up to at least where we're at here on this. In obedience to the Lord, Israel steps out, goes forward, and they battle against Og, the king of Bashan. And this guy, whether he's uh, nine and a half feet tall or 12 feet tall or 13 feet tall, all he presents is a larger target <laughs> and uh, no more uh, security from his size than uh, Goliath had from David's smooth stone that caught him in the forehead and brought him to the ground. Obedience to the Lord is the illustration here. The results of obedience are God's blessings, God's power, God's victories, and God's rewards. You and I uh, take from these things that if Israel had just kept on marching by now, the whole world would have long since been under the dominion of a Jewish king. And yet their, their uh, uh, 
attraction to the heathen, their attraction to idols, their attraction to worldliness and carnality, despoil their nation and their, their citizens and their children so that 20, 20 centuries worth of uh, uh, people have come and gone since the time of the Lord Jesus Christ and Israel is sparsely uh, more organized now than it was back then. Uh, out of the land for the most part. More Jews living out of the land than live in it. Few of them uh, are real believers of anything other than uh, their national uh, ethnicity and they missed the blessings of God altogether. The first chapter of Deuteronomy shows the disobedience and its fruit getting beaten and it leading to a presumption that uh, we can do anything we want or what God wants on our timing. And God says, you're going to do what I want on my timing or you're going to suffer for it. Far too many young people, far too many uh, old people today think they can live God's, uh, God's life when they feel like it. You, you better take it when God calls you to it because the blessings and the uh, consequences begin there uh, not to be put off. The uh, next two chapters show the, show the reverse of that. What obedience brings, victory and power. The kingdom of Og was, is reported to have been an a extremely powerful kingdom. It had high walls, uh, wide uh, walls, bars, gates, 60 cities that they took, uh, described here, some of them fortress cities, some of them just uh, uh, cities without walls and gates. Uh, archaeological results uh, shows the existence of strong fortified cities. Uh, some of these things are just now being dug up. Some of these things demonstrate archaeological skills, uh, stonework, and all, just the, the whole astronomical alignment of these things with incredible precision. Uh, this, is, this is before there were compasses, before there were telescopes, before there were uh, any uh, uh, applied sciences, I guess you'd say. How did they figure all these things out? Well, they had the ability not only by virtue of living long, uh, fairly long lives up until recently into our, our story here, uh, but also of... Uh, uh, Seems like pretty good memories. These these people didn't think. Well, I don't need to memorize that. I'll 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 just put it in a dictionary or something. And when I get around to it, I'll look it up. They didn't have those conveniences. They had to actually use their brain to achieve things and uh, achieve. They did. Uh, they uh, used a, a black uh, balsetic stone that's supposed to be some of the hardest stone. Uh, very iron laden, and it's it's the kingdom of giants because somehow, uh, as you read through your Bible, those giants are always connected with iron. Lucifer's connected with iron. Cain was collected, connected with iron. Cain is iron spear. There's something about that iron and that uh, that whole business when a, when a woman uh, has has problems. A lot of times, it's iron. Fe is the uh, symbol for iron, <laughs> uh, the uh, atomic symbol for iron. It's just just a whole bunch of interesting kind of things, and uh, these people had iron tools long before uh, other people had, and they apparently used them in working these stones. Uh, some of the oldest dwellings are Roman towers of uh, Haran and Bashan. Uh, they are described as simply built. Heavy blocks of balsit, roughly hewn and hard as iron, very thick walls, very strong stone gates and doors, many of which were about 18 inches thick and were formerly fastened with immense bolts, of which traces still remain. Such houses as these have been the work of the old giant tribe of the Rephaim, whose king Og was defeated by the Israelites 3,000 years ago. King Og was a giant belonging to that remnant uh, group, uh, the Rephium. Uh, Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 4 is described as uh, uh, six cubits in a span of nine and a half feet. Uh, you say, well, why did Moses mention his bed? Well, if you'd seen something that big, wouldn't you have mentioned it? It's sort of validation for how, how big these, uh, these people were. 
what I find interesting is uh, numerous things about these, but the land where they were is a land that God gave to Israel. They were in possession of that land when Israel came out. They had been there for quite some time, but clearly they came from somewhere else because they dispossessed other tribes to get it. Where did they come from? Very good question. I don't have any idea other than uh, the Bible says back in Genesis 6 that there were giants in the earth in those days. That is Noah's day. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. This was a, a, a recurrent theme in Noah's day, but it did not end in Noah's day. Obviously, by the time Israel comes out, we're a thousand years or so, at least after the flood. And you look at what's going on here. The giants are back. They've taken over land. They've taken over land that God gives to Israel. And uh, God's going to have to push them out of there. God told uh, Israel in Numbers 1351, which let's take a look back there for a minute. Numbers, uh, did I say 13? Numbers 33. Numbers 33. And uh, uh, verse 51. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then shall ye drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures. What do you suppose their pictures were about? Well, judging from the character of who these people were, I'd say they were probably pornographic in, in extremes. I would say that they were uh, depicting foreign uh, alien gods uh, in the extreme. And uh, God just simply tells them, don't, don't save that artwork for your museums. Don't save that for posterity. Don't save it so you can show people how the other half live. Don't think you have to see that artwork to know how bad it was. Take my word for it. It was bad. Destroy it. Don't try and save it. It'll only be pricks in your eyes and it'll, uh, it'll catch you. So he says, destroy all their pleasant pic all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. They were to, to retain nothing of that culture. They were not learn the ways of the heathen. The only way you'd be sure to not learn it is eradicate it from men's memories, take every vestige of that away. You know what the Christian life really is? The Christian life is learning how, how God wants us to live, what the tools and the, uh, the enablements are that God gives to the, to the child of God, and then spending the rest of our life applying those things to push out all of the things God says don't have anything to do with them. And the battle is in just how much are we going to push out. The success of the Christian life is how, how far are you going to push it away? How successful are you going to be keeping it out of your life? Because if it creeps back in, Guess what? you got to refight all, that, all for that ground that you lost. He goes on, pluck down all their high places, and ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land. Those, those giants, I mentioned this, I believe, last week, when they killed the, the men and the women and the children, the alternative for these people would be, here's Israel, let's get out. The rightful owner is coming. God had showed them the fear of Israel, Rahab the harlot knew that. All these other people knew that ever better as well as she did. She didn't make that up herself. They could have left and lived. God says, if you don't live, or if you don't leave, you're going to die. Because you're part of the images. You're part of the problem. You're not going to be uh, surviving. Uh, and you shall dispossess all the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it, and you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to the more you shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer you shall give the less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers, you shall inherit it. Well, I'd take that 12, and then they're going to figure out which, uh, which land they give. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass 
that all uh, those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Moreover, it shall come to pass that as I thought to, uh, as I shall do unto you, that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. So the, the consequences of that would be exactly what they got. God says, if you don't get rid of it, I'm going to drive you out. Now look back to Leviticus 18. I, I didn't look up every reference to all of these things that these people were doing, but I suspect this might give you a... Uh, a bit of a picture of what was going on in the land and uh, why in Noah's day everything had to be killed, people and animals. But by Moses' day, apparently the animals were okay to leave alive, but the people still needed to go. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18 and verse uh, 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch. Neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord thy God. I am the Lord. This Moloch was the God that you see. If you got an internet, you've probably seen pictures of it. It's a, it's a bronze God that kind of has its arms out like this and many of them. And they, it was hollow. They would actually build a fire, lay the babies or the children on these idols and literally bake them and then eat the flesh. Cannibalism was where the name uh, 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 comes from the land of Canaan and the priests of Baal. So it was Cana, Baal. The cannibal priests ate the flesh of these human sacrifices and that, that was to appease the, uh, the uh, heathen gods that they uh, served there. Verse 23 Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile their, thyself therewith. Why in the world would you need to put that down in, in a law when you moved into a new land? Apparently that's just what's going on there. That's what they're doing. How in the world could be that gross? The Rephaim, the giants, the culture of those people. That's why God says nothing of them is going to stay here. It's all got to go. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. God is not the author of confusion. They have a satanic religion that is sodomite in nature, perverse to the extremes with bestiality, uh, uh, every level of carnality, adultery, there are no moral standards uh, in these kingdoms whereby uh, God says there's anything left to redeem them. Someone who is reprobate is completely without moral or redeeming value. Not that God wouldn't save them, but they ultimately bring themselves to the point where they don't want to be saved. So he says in verse 24, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. So when God says, judge them, drive them out, or kill them, the option was theirs. Doesn't every man today get an option of deliver or die? You want to have eternal life? That's great. Here's how you get it. If you don't want it, that's okay. You don't have to have it. You can get whatever comes else. <laughs> Choice is yours. Uh, verse 25, and the land is defiled. Therefore, do I visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. Isn't it interesting? They didn't have this uh, multicultural, polytheistic uh, humanistic uh, slop uh, that has been uh, poured on America by the communist thinkers where you have to cater to all religions. If you want to live in this land, this is what you believe because that's who we are. You don't want to believe that. Keep moving. Go someplace else. 
Go make yourself happy someplace else. You like the benefits that, that serving God brings in this land, but you want to bring heathen into it? And that's America. They, they want the benefits of, of, of being a Christian under Christian uh, rules and laws and, and culture. It's at least Western culture. That's Christian culture. But they want to drag all of the uh, Islamic uh, nonsense and all of the, the uh, Far Eastern stuff in there and all of the African stuff in there. Take it back where you came from. We don't want it. God doesn't want it. Verse 27, for all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land spew not you out also when ye defile it as it spewed out the nations that were before you. Boy, I'll tell you what, that's pretty scary stuff. When you think about what these people were up to, and they, they seem to think God just going to smile, well, that's just the way we were raised. That's just what we were brought up. That's just, I don't want to step away from grandma's religion. Imagine raising children in that environment. What would they be? They, they'd be monsters by any, by any uh, vision you and I might have. But imagine what a holy God sees that. Man, it's, they're not just monsters. They are defiled, unclean must be judged. This idea, back in Deuteronomy 3, utterly destroying men and women of every city, uh, lots of infidels, lots of uh, syrupy, oh, I just, I just love everybody kind of, kind of people. I, I hesitate to call them Christians, although they may be. Just because just you're a Christian doesn't mean you got your head on straight. They sneer at that statement and they charge God with cruelty. They charge God with being unjust and unfair, unkind. These people had every opportunity to turn away from that religion and join Israel. They could have flat out rejected any of that stuff. And you don't get the idea that God wouldn't have allowed them to stay there. Maybe they'd have to go out and come back in, but... Uh, Whatever it was, it was okay. What the average man today does not recognize, and we were talking earlier about how people think and what, what people think, they do not recognize that God is righteous. God is not just somewhat righteous or righteous on certain topics. God is righteous. Righteous is an extension of the word right. So who does he think he is? God? Yes. It's exactly who he knows he is. He looked around one day and he turned and there was nobody there but him. And he says, I, I'm God. Here I am. I'm going to make me some places. I'm going to make me some angels. I'm going to make me some people. I'm going to make me some worlds. I'm going to control them. I'm going to have them so that they please me. Why wouldn't he? He's right. Anything that doesn't please him, it better get itself right. He'll make a way for them. To happen, if they don't take it, they're going to be out of the picture. He is long-suffering and not willing that they should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But God's righteousness is not flexible like man's. Well, if it's a certain person, it's okay. If it achieves a certain goal, it's okay. I heard a, uh, somebody told me a preacher was letting a man living in adultery stay in his church because he needed him. He needed somebody to run the sound system. I'm thinking to myself, man, that is, that is satanic. That's Balaam. Thinking you can just kind of negotiate and figure this. That's, man, that's, that's bad news. And, and what you do to the righteous in that is blasphemous. These people were buried in, in wickedness, vile habits, a culture that was so depraved that it preyed on the animals as their sexual victims. God has to deal in judgment with them. He could not permit them to exist as a righteous God, lest he have to apologize even to Sodom and Gomorrah at some point. So the question comes up is, who is there that is righteous enough to judge God? Well, isn't that what most people... 
How dare you say sodomites are not every bit as good as anybody else? Well, they are. All have sinned. But if they don't repent of that sin, God's not accepting them. If you don't repent of lying, God's not accepting you. So, uh, some interesting things here. Well, I just don't understand how God could take helpless little babies and kill their parents. Well, those helpless little babies, before they sin, are going to die and go to heaven. Isn't it amazing the very people that don't understand how that works think by dunking a, a wicked adult in water, they've made him righteous enough to live in God's heaven? <laughs> it's just it's really pretty bizarre. Or tell you that unless your baby gets baptized, they're not going to heaven? That's cruel. That's more cruel than God judging the wicked. Infidelity might sneer. Syrupy sentimentality might turn its nose up at it, stumble over it. But the true believer, the de devoted Christian, can also take these, these high-minded high things of, well, I just, I just think there must be some way God, God, God doesn't have to do that. No, there isn't. If it's wicked, it must be judged. All sin earns the wages of its actions, death. In Genesis 18.25, we read, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. His, his mercy, his kindness, his grace is extensive and vast. But it is limited by men coming to terms and being reconciled to God, God does not need to reconcile himself to anyone. God does not need to change his attitude towards you. It is you and I that need to change our attitude and lives towards him. Psalm, uh, uh, I got read Psalm 10. Did I write that down right? That almost doesn't sound like a right reference. I just printed it out, which I don't, always do. Psalm 10. Let's look over there for a minute. We're, we're almost done here. We'll be done here in a couple minutes. Say, so, well, I just don't understand why some people don't get saved. They're real nice. Maybe you think they're real nice. <laughs> Maybe that real nice is not God's estimation of them. It says uh, in verse 4, Psalm 10, verse 4, The wicked through pride of his countenance will not seek after God. The reason he won't get saved because he won't look after God. He's in, not interested in what God has. Pride. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Well, you probably know people like that. But I'm going to tell you something. They might go through this entire lifetime never once being adversity. Anybody think they're going to go through the white throne judgment without being in adversity? God's going to be right. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages and the secret places. Doth he murder the innocent? Boy, that sounds almost like uh, Planned Parenthood and the doctors and the nurses that hide behind their veneer of science and words. They're no longer babies. They're fetuses. Well, that's not, a, that's not an eagle egg. What is it? Well, I don't know. It's a little round white thing. I've, we don't call them eggs because you can go to jail for breaking one of those. You can kill babies with impunity and get paid for it quite well. He murdered the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. False humility. Well, we're just so for the poor. We've got to guard the poor. We've got to protect the poor against those wicked Republicans, those wicked this, those wicked that. 
And all the while, they're just using these poor fools. You know, the Candace Owen, anybody know who she is? She's a, a young black woman. She was a, a wild-eyed liberal for a long time and finally came around to, to conservative thinking. But she sort of exemplifies these verses here where she says, don't you people realize you've been voting Democrat for 60 years and look where it's gotten you. In, in murderous ghettos where you won't even let the police, you, you've so messed up yourself, you won't even let the police come in there and be the police. Your children are murdering each other and you think it's somebody's fault that you won't elect. <laughs> he croucheth, he humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten, he hideth his face, you'll never see it. You know what they think? God's a do-nothing God. He's probably there. He don't care. He's not interested in these things. Nancy Pelosi says abortion is doing God's work. What a wicked woman. False humility. How dare anybody think that she's, she's a hater. She's a Catholic. Weren't those the guys that were responsible for the Inquisition that lasted a thousand years? Did they do that in love? Did I miss something? Anyway, boy, it's awful when you put illustrations that are right out of the newspaper, isn't it? Verse 12, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the, the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked condemn God? He has said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. That wicked man is condemning of God, and he says God's never going to require any accountability. God loves you. God cares about you. God's on your side no matter what you do. He loves you. You know what they're doing? They're accusing the God of all righteousness, truth, and judgment of being unkind and unfair. You're just thinking about him wrongly. Wow. God says he lifts up his hand and says, live, and you live. When he puts it down, look out. Wherefore doth the wicked condemn God, contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to require, requite it uh, with thine hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. Ooh, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. I'm not going to read any more, but you know what? One of these days, what Israel was tasked with back there is going to complete it, be completed by the Lord himself. There will be no Canaanite in the land. That's the promise in Zechariah 14. And there will be no more Canaanite in the land. That land is not going to be defiled. That's God's country. That's God's land. Israel will be back there living in all the blessings and the promises of God. Rest assured that when people are trying to condemn God, that, that con con contem is a hard word to say, but it's a, sort of a combination of contempt for God and condemning God at the same time for God's righteousness. And that's just what people do when they think, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about sodomy. The Bible doesn't say anything about abortion. The Bible does. Yeah, it does. It says something about all of those things. And what it says is you better not do it or you're going to be wicked and dead. Only God has the judgment to decide in a governmental fashion what is right and what is wrong. And the Bible reveals those things. Israel was thankful that God had showed them the high and lofty laws of God. America was formed under those high, noble of purpose laws of God that were meant to protect people, people's liberties, freedoms, conscience, and uh, all of those things. And they've been slowly eroded away to where now we have little more uh, reality in our Constitution than the Russian government has that promises all of the same things 
but for you personally if you don't bother anybody else with it. America recognizes you have the right to publish your thoughts, even if everybody else hates them. And the fact that they hate them gives you the more protection for saying them. We've lost in America the true sense of God altogether, and that's exactly what the devil is aiming at. He wants to lead every heart away from God, every heart into a position of trusting God, but not the God of the Bible. Trusting the words of the Bible, but not the words of the Bible that are too harsh or seem unfair culturally and irrelevant to their thoughtfulness. Man, by his very nature, cannot comprehend God, must simply accept God on God's terms and at God's purpose, that his purpose is to purify and make men holy so that he can have a relationship with them. Thank God that that's his goal. If it was any less than that, we'd all be dead already. <laughs> His mercy does indeed endure to all generations. Let's stand.